difference in those two songs there. First song we're singing, it's really Moses. Moses was in the Old Testament and, and he wants to see God. And God says, go in the cleft of this rock and I'm going to put my hand there and you get to see my backside. And that's all you get to see. And, and you're meeting with God in that place seeing him, but the New Testament is that veil has been ripped, and, and he's no longer in just this one little spot. Now he can dwell within us, and we're asking him to fill this place. We're not asking him to fill this building, we're asking him to fill us, to change us. And so, when I ask these questions, do you feel like a NASCAR driver going round and round and round as fast as you can? and not stopping? Does anybody ever feel like that? You're going around and around not getting anywhere? <laughs> you feel like you are constantly in a rush but never getting anywhere or getting anything accomplished? Do you feel like your, bo like your body is present but your mind is somewhere else? You're having a conversation. <laughs> yeah. You're having a conversation with someone. You're sitting there. You're standing there and you're looking him in the eye, but you're not there. You're thinking about three million other things. Do you feel like you need a vacation, a week's vacation, a month's vacation, a year, a decade? Are you tired physically and mentally even when you wake up first thing in the morning? Are most of your relationships superficial? In other words, you're not close, you're distant from everyone? Must your mind be constantly amused? In other words, you're always doing something, you've got you to gotta be doing something, whether it's watching TV, playing on Facebook, playing games, reading something, listening to the radio, watching movies, something going on so you're not alone in your head or alone if you have those problems as I've had those problems we need God to come in and fill up but we have to let him in we have to take that moment to say I'm here to meet with you I'm here and I want you in my life in all these situations and all these thoughts and all these feelings, I want you in it. I want you there with me. And in order to get rid of some of these problems, because you know, you can get rid of those problems, but they're like an old dog that you fed in the past. He's going to come back. If, if, if you've been distracted by all these things in your life and, and, and going to sleep with the... Uh, TV on because you don't even want um, that moment of silence. You get rid of that and it comes back. Unless you continually have Jesus in you filling you up, these old problems come back. And I speak from experience because um, I have gotten rid of these things and then they creep back in, and they take back over. And uh, um, so this is experience speaking. And I have gotten away from the things that we're talking about. Oh, I had gotten away from them, and I've been adopting them again, and bringing me that piece that I was missing. But <clears throat> the idea of, of this sermon and uh, the next several is the answers to all these questions because if you answered some of those questions that you you do have all these feelings you have what's called the hurried sickness you always hurry always in a hurry to go somewhere to go and do something you you're rushing for no reason I remember talking with somebody about this that their dad was always like this. They're driving their dad from this place to this place to this place. And the dad would get there and he'd sit down and he'd talk with whoever it was for a little bit. Then he'd be ready to go and he wanted to go and we want to go now. Well, where are we going? We're going home. 
Well, what do you got to do? Nothing. I want to go. Let's go. But your mind is always in a hurry to rush to get somewhere, to do something. And even in the little conversations, this is why your why relationships are superficial, you rush through relationships. You don't have real conversations. You just kind of go, nice day. Yeah, it is. Strange weather. Uh-huh. See ya. Because we're too busy and too hurried to have deep contact. So, simplicity, silence, and solitude are the answers to this hurried lifestyle, to this hurried sickness. So the first one we're going to go into is simplicity. And that's written on your paper there. Ecclesiastes 7.29 God made us plain and simple, but we have made ourselves very complicated. We have a very complicated world. We have very complicated relationships. They even make movies that, that say it's complicated. People on your Facebook status are you in a relationship, out of a relationship? It's complicated. Everything has to be complicated. It's not how God made it. That's how we make it. I was just thinking about, I mean, I've been thinking about this for weeks, but I was thinking about it this morning. How complicated are holidays? Holidays are simple. But in today's new world, I thought it was complicated when I had to go to my... Grandma White's and my Grandma Houston's house. We had to stop at two places in the same town of Irving. And I thought that was complicated as a child. Now people have six homes they have to go to because we have moms and dads and stepdads, family, and then his separated family, and you have to hit all these places. We complicated everything. God didn't complicate it. So we have these, all these complications, and I think of it like clutter. We have clutter in our lives, in our houses, in our minds, in our friendships, just in our life. Clutter. I think I did a sermon about that a long time ago, and I took all these pieces of clothes and I threw them all over the, the floor. And that's how our life is. It's all kind of cluttered, all kind of here and there and everywhere, and not fixed and straight and, okay, we're here and we're heading there. If, we, if you decide today to drive to St. Louis, are you going to head out north? That's what we do in our lives. We have where we're headed to, St. Louis, which is that direction, but we'll head out in that direction in our life, and then we'll head over this way, and then we'll head over that way, and we just, we're not focused on where we're going and what we're doing. We get very complicated, we get very cluttered. <clears throat> and I think of, when I think of simplicity or simple life, I think of things like Little House on the Prairie. Nice little simple life, living out in the middle of nowhere, not having every week to get the car fixed or fix the air conditioning or the all, all the things in our lives that are always broken down. It was just simple. It wasn't difficult. But now when we say simple, we think of simpleton. We think of somebody who's not smart whose life is a waste is kind of what we think of when we think of simple. We always want something amazing. But just as I was thinking about simple things, I thought of one of my favorite shows is uh, the Swiss Family Robinson. They're stuck out on an island, just their family, and they make do with what they've got. It's kind of like Gilligan's Island. 
<laughs> you're out there, and you. It, was it some, I heard a comedian say, you know what? They can make a movie theater, but they can't. Or they can make uh, a whole movie company because they did that on one of their shows, making a movie. But they can do all that, but they can't build a boat and get off the island. But they had a simple life. And so I made a list of different little things. Um, the Wilderness Family, anybody remember that show? The, the whole family packs up. They leave the city because the son has, is having breathing problems. and They need to get out of the smog and everything in the, of the city. And they move up into the mountains. And, uh, yeah, they get attacked by everything under the sun. But, but they're living in this cabin. And they're all together, and, they're, and it's like they're all on the same team fighting together. But the way it happens in our world today, instead of the family all fighting together against something, they're all fighting with each other. And so I'm, just think of that simplicity. Another, another mode of thinking about that is thinking of Amish people. You know, I doubt that the Amish mom goes to her closet and has a real difficult time figuring out what she's going to wear that day. Or the black one. <laughs> the black one. Or maybe the black one. Or maybe the black and white one. And so, I mean, I don't think it's a real complicated thing. And I don't think they have the difficulty like I do when you go to the grocery store and try and figure out which kind of chicken do you want. I feel like chicken. Well... There's three billion kinds of chicken. What kind of chicken do you want? No, they go out to the shed and they wring the neck of the chicken and they have chicken. <laughs> it's too live. If, if it was live in my house, I don't want to eat it. But that's, I mean, it's difficult, but it's simple. It's simple. So, but our world says complicated is better. Our world says the more that you got, the better you are. And it's, it's this whole idea of more and more and more and more. And uh, what do you have when you get more and more? Let's just think of something. Um, you have movies. Um, what happens when you have lots of movies? Benny? What happens when you have lots of movies? Um, no, no, that's, you probably do, but that's not what I'm thinking of. What I'm thinking of is you. Maybe you don't have this problem at home, but I have this problem at home. But you have the problem. Exactly, and you get. <laughs> you have the you have the DVD player. And on top of the DVD player is the movies that have been watched this week. And there's a pile of them. And when you, when you get more, and that's just one little thing, I keep talking about movies. Um, when you get things, and you get more and more and more, what you get is piles and piles and piles. And you get clutter. And uh, so one of the things to do with simplicity, maybe for each one of us, getting rid of some of our files. And one thing I want to point out, all these things that I'm talking about are suggestions. These are not laws. This is a direction. This isn't, well, Randy said I need to get rid of this, so I'm going to get rid of these things, and, and then I'm good with God. No, God loves you. He doesn't care whether you have files or not. Um, but uh, these are suggestions to help us with the problems that we've got. I mean, a good example, yesterday I'm trying to do this stuff as, as I'm looking for my pieces of paper. I've sat a pile of books on top of it. So I'm looking for that, and I knock over another pile of something. And uh, so, I mean, you get these distractions. You get these distractions in your life. Anyway, <clears throat> so what, 
instead of all being Amish, um, what, what does it look like? What does being simple look like? Uh, somebody read to me Philippians 4, 11 through 13. First one there, start reading. Philippians 4, 11, 11 through 13. So what word sticks out there to you? To me, content. He's content whether I have a lot or a little, whether I'm full or I'm hungry. All the things that we worry about, Jesus talked about in um, uh, Matthew 7, where he's talking about all the worries that we have, about how we're dressed. And well, it's so full of pride. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. It, di it didn't matter how many things he had. It didn't matter how much, um, how many labor-saving devices he had. It was okay. It was okay if he sat down and relaxed. But it was also okay if he didn't stop working and was working a 20-hour day. Whichever way was okay with him. It was all right. He was content in the situation. Our problem is, is we're not content. No matter what we have, we're discontented. And that's the point of this simplicity. Is we need to begin to be content with what we have. Instead of always, always, always searching for that next thing. Because we think that next thing is going to make us happy. That next thing doesn't make us happy. Somebody be real. What was the thing this week that you thought was going to make you happy? And you got. Yes, Julie. Star Trek Marathon. Star Trek Marathon. And you watched several of the Star Treks and that you haven't seen before. And all it did was, was I was having, it was kind of fun because relaxing and stuff, but all it did was I was supposed to write, I woke up, I was supposed to do the laundry, I was supposed to do this, I was like, no, I'll just watch part of it. <laughs> so were you sitting there content? Or were you sitting there going, I'm doing this, but I should be doing this and this and this, and worrying? You were doing both. So, and that's, that's my point. It's not to make new laws that say um, you can't do these things or you can't have too much of this. The point is to find that place of content and knowing that the acquisition of new things are not going to make us happy. Because when you die, how many of those things do you take with you? Nothing. And are we going to be happy? We're going to be eternally happy. So if we could acquire those things here that are going to make us happy, shouldn't we be able to take them with us? That doesn't bring true happiness and true enjoyment. It doesn't bring it. What what lasts? People, God's word, and Him. What else lasts forever? What lasts past when we take the big dirt now? What else lasts? What? Yes, Finn. Heaven. Yeah. That lasts forever. My, my piles of things that only made me happy for a little bit until I saw the next thing. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. 
because my eyes never get tired of seeing. As soon as I get the thing that I wanted, I'm going to find something else that I wanted. So if I'm looking for contentment and happiness and that, it's not going to continually make me happy. So, a part of this is ordering our private world. It's not the world of things and stuff. It's ordering what's in here. Um, another simple thing is how many ideas do we have floating around in our head? Um, with people, this is for Julia, Lincoln, one of our greatest leaders, as a child, did he have even a library as small as that one? No. He had the Bible, he had Aesop's Fables, and Pilgrim's Progress. And Pilgrim's Progress. Those were the books that he had. But as his stepmom said, he knew all of them, cover to cover. He knew what was in those. And I mean, just think about this for a minute. When you were uh, us older folks, the adults here, um, when you were little, did you have all kinds of books, or did you have a few books that you looked at all the time? We didn't have a lot of books. We didn't have a lot of books. But the ones that I did have, I can still remember. We found one a little while back, and it was stupid. It was a little ghost named George. I don't know. But I found it. And I remembered every page. And there was this other one. I don't even remember the name of it. But this, it was a little cartoon guy, and he made donuts. And he had a donut factory. And I still remember those pictures. I don't remember the name. But I would look at that book and look at that book and look at that book. It's kind of like a little kid with a movie. And they'll watch that same movie over and over and over and over and over. Lincoln was one of those people who was, it would seem simple, because he's only got a couple of books. George Mueller is another one. He was known as a man of one book, the Bible. Now, he said later in his life he really drew things out of biographies, but mostly it was that one book. And that simplifies what's running around in our brain. The same clutteredness that I was talking about, things being thrown all over, we have that going on in our heads. We have a little bit of this running around, a little bit of this running around, a little bit of this, and a little bit of this. And does that make for calm, peacefulness? Or does that make for spaghetti brain? Things going all over and here and there and craziness. Okay, the importance of being simple and enjoying life, being content in what was going on. So the next one, we have simplicity. The next one is silence. This is one we have a real hard time with. And silence is kind of hooked up with the other one, solitude. And it's very difficult to separate the two. So as I go through, you may go, well, some of that has to do with being alone. Yeah, but most of the time you need uh, to be alone, to be silent. <laughs> so they're kind of hooked, but I'm separating them in a way. So the verse here is Psalms 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. What is it? Let's imagine we're in church and we have wiggly kids. When you say, be still, what do you mean? Do you mean more than stop moving? Be quiet and be still. Listen. Listen. Pay attention. Stop acting the wrong way. So be still means more than 
stop movement. Because it's kind of like, um, I remember the old joke that um, the kids told to sit down, and he says, but I'm standing up on the inside. We can be quiet and still to someone else's view, but inside we're still got stuff going on. This silence has to do with that too. Calming. Calming our inside. And we're not talking cross-legged. Um, we're talking... <laughs> we're talking godly. Quietness, solitude, not zen. <coughs> And throughout the Bible, we have people who went off on their own, went on to solitude, and were silent to hear God. Abraham did not hear God say, your children are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky when he's hanging out in the middle of a crowd. He was out alone, in the dark, no lamp going, looking up into the sky in the quiet, probably quiet hillside at night in the dark, sitting alone, looking up at billions of stars. And he's just like, wow. And God says, you're going to have that many descendants. Moses, when he had difficulty where did he go? He went to the tent. He went to the tent of meeting and was alone with God. People, people knew his routine so well, it said that they stood outside their tent and watched Moses head up to be with God. That's how important it was. Oh, Moses is going to be with God. Let's all watch him. That must be really important. Maybe I should do that. Joshua, when he takes over from Moses, when he's going in and he doesn't know what to do, he goes outside of the camp and is in solitude and in silence and meets the angel who tells him, you walk around in circles. When David needed to hear from God, he did just what he did when he was a little boy, out watching the sheep. He got quiet. He knew that was how I found God, sitting, watching over his creation in silence. How many hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of silence did David have? Enough to write a whole honking book of psalms. <laughs> And that was written and memorized, because I doubt he wrote them all down. He had his little guitar. He didn't do like me and have his little song book. These were all things that were deep inside of him. They were deep inside of him because he went over them and over them and over them and over them. We kind of go not to put you down, Julia, but you said, you've probably heard this story a hundred times. That's okay. We need to hear it again and again and again. So it's not just a story. It is truth that now lives within us. And when we see anything in life, this is why you can see God in anything. Even in in, in terrible, awful things, you can look and you can see God. If you have enough of this in you, you can see Him in everything. But that only happens when you take that time to go over those, do the simple things over and over and over until it becomes a part of you. But how are we? Let's 
stop and go here. This is what we're supposed to be like. But here we are over here, falling off the edge of the cliff. We are distracted. We are constantly distracted. The reason we don't sit this direction with the things open because I know I'm this way, so I know most of you are this way. As soon as each car goes by, oof, oof. and I bet you some of you still have a big problem because this is here and you see somebody walk by and your mind gets distracted. We get distracted by anything. <clears throat> I have an everyday example. For mm -hmm. I just see, I mean, this woman, she memorizes chapters of the Bible. That, I mean, she lives alone. She has a lot of time alone with the Lord. She doesn't watch TV very much. She doesn't listen to radio very much. And that's what she does is spend a lot of time with the Lord. And by doing that, I mean, she can just sit there, oh, okay, yeah, I don't have to look that up because I already know it, and rattle it off, you know? <laughs> But we get distracted on everything. Whether it's our eyes getting distracted, whether it's our ears getting distracted, whether it's our mind going somewhere else. That's what I was saying about being in a conversation. If I'm sitting here having a conversation with Kelly, and she starts saying something, maybe my mind goes, oh yeah, i got to worry about this other thing over here. And while I'm thinking about this other thing over here, she just said something really important. And she's waiting for me to respond. Do I go, <laughs> and what she had just said was, I have this really bad problem. Do you think it's really bad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I wasn't paying attention. I was not present in that conversation. <laughs> I remember my mom talking about that when she used to uh, talk with Mike Clayton, the, the lady who had mine the restaurant with the egg roll. Um, I just lost half of you. Uh, <laughs> she, that was always her thing. She said, Mai would be talking, and she would be constantly trying to understand each word that she was saying, but she didn't understand what she was saying. And she was always afraid that Mai, being skinny, would say, do you think I'm fat? And my mom would go, uh-huh. Because she'd just always go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and that's the way we are in a conversation. We're distracted by everything else, and we're not present. Any, anybody else have this problem, or is this just me? Okay. Are you distracted right now? And just going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So... Here's another part of it, and this is one that I had said to someone, and they're like, that's not a problem. I, when I ran the restaurant over here, I would listen to sermons all day long, all day long, all day long. And uh, then I would listen to worship music, and I'd listen to this, and I'd always have something godly going in the ears and I said you know what I found this to be a problem because I always have something going in but I never have time for God to speak and this is what I've done why I said I've fallen back into these situations and and had this problem again is I noticed what I would do I would do stuff on the computer, and and I'd watch a movie, and then it, it's time to go to bed, and I would hook in my earphones, and I would listen to Raven Hill as I'm going to sleep, and I'm thinking, well, I'm doing all these right things, but I never had that time just to be quiet, and this is whether we get it or not. It's a nice little, cute little puzzle. And this is what happens to all this information. We have all the information, 
And we have little bits and pieces. And re remember what the picture is. It's, it's Jesus. And uh, we have all these little bits and pieces of information about Jesus. But all of it is separate. So, yeah, some of it we get lost. And uh, so, in order to put a puzzle together, what do you have to do? Is that right? Yeah. But it's flat here, and it's flat here, and it's flat here, and it's got a little piece here. Looking from this direction, doesn't that look right? Doesn't that look all right? In order to put, in order to put the puzzle together, you have to take the time. That one, that one's not it. I have some pieces that go together. You have to take time. Ooh. You have to take the time and put the pieces together that are supposed to go together. But when you don't allow that time, you have those pieces of a puzzle, and then we listen to so-and-so sermon, and we have those other pieces of puzzle, and then we look up so-and-so on the Internet and find another little piece of God's little puzzle, and then we listen to this worship song and we go, ooh, wow, that's cool, I've never heard that before. We get more pieces of puzzles, and we keep getting puzzle pieces and puzzle pieces and puzzle pieces, but we never take the time. We get too much, and they're all just going everywhere. And what do we got? A mess. We got clutter everywhere. This is all the things that we're supposed to be putting together with God, but we never take the time to be alone and to have some silence to hear Him, to know how to be wise little men and women and put the things together and have a clear picture of what He's saying. We have like little bits, there we go, little bits of information, but it's not all a clear picture. So a word that I have on the page there, amusement. The enemy of silence is amusement. Everybody knows what amusement is. You go to an amusement park, and you've heard me say this before, but sometimes we have to stop and think what a word means. Amuse. Uh, spend our life being amused, being entertained. A is without, so without muse is to think, without thinking. This is that shutting off, trying to shut off the brain. But instead of a silent, calm, not thinking, we go into a being dragged along in some type of story, play, something. And instead of thinking, we're just being dragged along by something else. Not being dragged along by God, by His thoughts. We're being amused by little bubbles on a screen or whatever. We're being amused, not thinking. So, I don't want you to be amused at the moment because there's not going to be a little cartoon up here dancing around doing anything. I want us to be silent. See how many of us can pass this test. You have a gift. Every Sunday God gives you a gift of a day off, relaxation. God is giving you a gift of silence. Now I'm not telling you what to do with this silence, but if you fall asleep, I'm going to wake you up in the sofa. Five minutes. Be silent.
and wake up. <clears throat> Just like in Julia's story, if Jesus can calm a storm, he can calm us. And it's just like uh, working out, lifting weights, doing different things to help your body. Our mind has to be trained in order to do these things. And I'm sure we all got distracted at different points and whatever we were trying to do. And, uh, but... This is this is what something I read. It was somebody in like the 15th century, brother somebody or other, and he said, uh, "Once I figured out that I was a failure at prayer, it was okay. You're you're going to fail. You're going to fail at trying to be." trying to have a perfect quietness and the calmness. So uh, you're going to fail. So just go with that and know that anything you do is all right. You're going to fall short. So it's okay. So as long as you get that out of your head, so the devil's not going, see, you're no good. You can't even be quiet for five minutes. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, that's our quietness. In this silence, and next here is solitude, in this solitude, um, what we're looking for is a place of peace. Jesus promised us peace. If he promised us peace, that means we can get it. And you know what? Our whole world needs peace. Let's look, look at solitude number three there. Um, Psalm 139. Somebody read that real loud for me. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You can see my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Okay, so this is God searching you, knowing you, and in the middle of that psalm is where it talks about you knitted together in your mother's womb. We know all that part. But this is God searching us. We need to do the same thing. If God knows the words and thoughts, the words that are going to come out of our mind, shouldn't we know the words that are going to come out? Shouldn't we know the thoughts that are in our head? And unless we find that silence and that solitude, we're never going to find that. People go out to the mountains in, in Colorado to find themselves. All you have to do is shut up, turn everything off, and find out why you act the way you act. Why do you do the stupid things that you do? God wants to tell you. He wants to help you. Our problem is, is solitude is something that nobody wants to find. Because there's a danger. There's an e a perceived evil in there. And I'm going back to my movie thoughts. Jonathan, this one's for you. Here's, here's the picture. There's the cave. And I'm taking in my weapon. My master tells me, you don't need a weapon in there. Just go in. And Luke goes in. And in the cave, he meets his father. He was afraid to go into that cave. There's a fear in us that doesn't like alone. That doesn't like quiet. Because there's things that run around in the quiet that we don't know and we don't understand. Just like Luke, we have to face that fear. Well, Yoda also said you only take, you only have what you take in with you. Yeah. So, so, 
as long, I mean, just put, go back to the movie. What if Luke never went in there? He was always too afraid. The emperor never would have died. <laughs> because he had to face his fears before he took the next step. You are stuck where you are until you face those things. Until you face who you are. Why you act the way you are. And accept that you're going to fail. That doesn't make you a failure. You're going to have difficulties. Face it. It's okay. But you have to face that fear. You have to face that fear. But finding those alone times is what this solitude here that I'm going to talk about for just a minute, those, that solitude is somewhere in your day. But it's stolen from us or we take it from ourselves. When you're asleep, and maybe you hear the alarm, or maybe you hate alarms and don't have an alarm off, and your eternal clock wakes you up, there's a moment. There's a few minutes. Nobody else, unless they're standing at the end of the bed going, WAKE UP! Nobody else knows you're awake. Just you and God. And you can either run from that, or you can embrace that. The next point, you brush your teeth, you go in the other room, you're eating your breakfast, drinking your coffee, and you can find a quietness there. What this is is little slices of your day, and maybe yours, maybe breakfast isn't the place for you. Maybe yours is sitting on the toilet. <laughs> Hopefully, I mean, my house, nobody gets even near the door when I'm in the bathroom. Some houses, people walk in and out. So that's not your spot. But wherever those spots are, a good one for me, right, it's been the joke, mowing therapy. I'm out on the mower. Uh, me and God on the mower. Now other times I take music with me. But other times it's just two and a half hours of nothing. But whatever me and God decide to talk about. Another place is driving. There is not a law that says you have to have a radio on. If you're driving alone, there is not a law that says you have to be listening to anything. That is a time of solitude. And you can either use it and face those fears and face yourself. Because, I mean, a lot of times people, maybe you just don't like yourself. Maybe that's the reason you don't want to spend alone time with yourself. Well, maybe you need to learn to love yourself. Because, <clears throat> you know, in that quiet, you hear all kinds of things you don't want to hear. There's all kinds of thoughts that run around our head that maybe we don't like. But we have to deal with those things. <clears throat> So here's the surrender that you need to do. This is the action for, because you know, you get a sermon and there should be some action that's taken. And your action, your surrender to this, is trying to find those, that simplicity in life, those moments of silence and solitude. And in that, you grow and grow closer to God. And... And if you got distracted and didn't hear part of the sermon, you're going to hear the next the next three weeks or so. It's going to be the same little bits and pieces. And there's going to be more in, in simplicity, and we're going to talk about that probably one week, and talk about silence another week, and maybe we'll have a half an hour of silence, I don't know. Uh, to make you do it. It's like making you do your homework. You, you have to be quiet. Um, but from personal experience, getting away from it, it helps. You know what? It doesn't make you any better in God's eyes. He doesn't love you anymore because you did it. That's not the point. The point is we have an existence here and we're going to have to live 
however long that is. And you want to live a happy, contented life instead of a discontented life. And uh, these things will help. So uh, try and surrender to it. Find five minutes a day to get quiet. Find those little slices when you wake up, when you walk along the road, when you lie down to have that quietness and that personal silent relationship with God. Help us, Lord. <laughs> Amen.